Tensions between the United States and both Iran and North Korea are at an all-time high. Iran recently announced intentions to enrich uranium to weapons-grade levels in the face of additional sanctions by the U.S., which the Trump administration says are designed to bring that country back to the negotiating table after the U.S. walked away from the 2015 International Nuclear Agreement with Tehran. This as the United States continues discussions with North Korea regarding its nuclear program. I sat down with Paul Musgrave, assistant professor of political science at UMass Amherst, for the latest on these situations. If you had said two summers ago that President Trump would not only be meeting regularly with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, but would actually literally go to North Korea, I think that people would have been astonished. I mean, the whole title, Fire and Fury, that uh, that book used to go inside the Trump administration, that was President Trump's threat to Kim Jong-un about what would happen if he didn't give up his nuclear program. And now instead, the two leaders, by all accounts, seem to really want to conclude some sort of deal, and President Trump is priding himself on being one of Kim's better friends. So it's really been a dramatic turnaround in the last two years. And it's certainly a historic trip, certainly for a president to go inside North Korea. I mean, that's something that's unheard of. It is unheard of. It would have been unthinkable. I mean, there are people who criticize the president for this, and I think that there is some basis to do that, that maybe this is giving him too much status. On the other hand, you know, if you look at President Trump in the context of the last three decades, he is just the most recent president to deal with an almost intractable problem, which is that North Korea has a nuclear program, now has nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them. And how do you get around that problem? How do you convince them to give that up? And President Trump seems to have decided that his policy is going to be one of offering carrots, removing sanctions, offering investments in order to get North Korea to give up its nuclear program. That's a big bet, and it's one that right now it looks like Pyongyang is hoping that they can do a deal before the re-election cycle in order to give President Trump a policy win. But he did walk away um, from the talks in Vietnam in February because there was no deal. And, of course, then came back and, and started to do some relationship building here. Do you think he's going to move? I think that there's a lot of wheels within wheels going on right now. When President Trump walked away from the summit in Hanoi, he walked away because he didn't think that there was a deal that he could live with. It was a strong signal. It was also a signal couched in President Trump, making clear that he still wanted to build that relationship. There are hardliners within the administration, probably most notably National Security Advisor John Bolton, who really want to do no deal whatsoever. And what's become obvious over the past several months is that those hardliners have actually been sidelined, that actually President Trump, who really wants to do you know, the art of the deal with the North Koreans, is trying to push for some sort of an arrangement, for some sort of a bargain. And I think the really serious question is, what would America, what would the United States be willing to give up as part of that bargain? What kind of concessions or compromises are on the table? And I think, you know, when you talked a little bit about some criticism that he received really from both sides of the aisle, with some people saying, listen, you're shaking hands with a rogue leader, um, and, and this is just a photo op. Do you think that there's some credibility to those criticisms? This is one of those areas that I go back and forth on. People that I really respect think that there's such prestige and such benefit to meeting with an American president that you should hold that out in order for progress. On the other hand, we've been dealing with this problem for 30 years. Holding out the prospect of a meeting didn't get us any closer to nuclear abolition or to climbing down on the South Korean, on the Korean Peninsula. And so meet with him, talk with him. Uh, I, I actually think that President Trump in this regard is maybe a little bit undisciplined, maybe without doing the sort of prep work. But in general, I think that meeting and talking with the Korean government is the right way to be proceeding. And certainly if Kim Jong-un took a deal or, or started to uh, negotiate, I mean, his economy would, would turn around. And I think that's one thing that people are talking about, you know, what's in it for him? Well, that's in it for him, really. That's right. And the United States has led what they call the maximum pressure campaign in order to put as many sanctions and to put as much economic hurt on North Korea to force them to the bargaining range. And over the last couple of weeks, the U.S. has also kind of below the headlines been tightening up the inspections regime, offering rewards for information about how North Korea is trying to defeat that, to smuggle in things. So there's a lot that could be done. And the question is, is the United States really going to be able to coordinate a move out of that regime 
regime with the same sort of solidarity that the Chinese and Russians and other stakeholders have displayed in moving into that, because the Chinese connection is very important. And just before President Trump made his historic visit, President Xi Jinping of China had already made his visit to North Korea as well. So the Kim government is very good at trying to play both sides. Okay, now let's talk about another rogue state, Iran. Uh, there's some new developments there. Bring us up to speed. Well, over the past couple of weeks, the Iranian government has tried to show that it is serious about moving forward with its nuclear program. And right now, that's not a nuclear weapons program. That is an enrichment program that could possibly be used to turn into weapons-grade plutonium, but could also have civilian applications. And the great irony is that just as President Trump is trying to make a new deal on the Korean Peninsula, he, of course, walked away from the JCPOA, which was this big deal that was trying to contain the Iranian nuclear program. Right, but I think a lot of the reasons why he had said he had walked away is like, it, it, this was a bad deal, nothing in it for us, and it doesn't surprise anybody that Iran is now uh, breaching that deal as well. And this is one of those areas where I think President Trump has decisively sided with the hardliners. You know, from Netanyahu to Bolton to an entire consensus in Washington that Iran can't be trusted, that this was a deal that didn't have the kind of safeguards or especially the kind of timeline over which that deal could play out. The criticism from the Obama administration, from the people who negotiated this deal, is there was nothing more that could have been done in 2014, 2015 to get a better deal. And now, if the United States and Iran were to go back to the bargaining table, Iran isn't just sitting on a few dozen, a few hundred centrifuges, but thousands of centrifuges and a lot more enriched uranium. And it's a lot closer to reaching that nuclear capability, which puts them in a stronger uh, position. And this is why I think that people are really afraid about the prospect for armed intervention, um, because both at the negotiating table, where the two sides are kind of trading insults, and also incidents like the shoot down of that $130 million right. U.S. drone, there's a lot of kindling that could turn into a fire. A lot of tension, and President Trump did do an about face quickly on any sort of military in intervention, which I believe had been on the table and discussed. So sanctions were put in place a few weeks ago again, again escalating tensions there. What about the European countries that remain in the deal now, obviously they're looking at Iran like, yeah, you're not you're not keeping your end of the bargain. I think the great surprise has been that even though the Europeans really want to keep everybody into the deal, the United States and its sanctions regime cutting Iran off from the international financial system has been so successful that the Europeans are mostly going ahead with it. And so they're unhappy. Um, but in terms of concrete achievements to undermine that regime, they really haven't done anything. So what's next for the U.S. Uh, with Iran? Well, that's really the key question. And you mentioned uh, that there was a possibility of American reprisals. If you believe some news reports, planes were being fueled or armed or possibly even in the air to carry that out when President Trump decided that the casualties would be too great, this was too big of an escalation. I think it's clear that both sides have divisions about how to approach the other. There are hardliners in Tehran. There are softliners in Washington. President Trump has made the calculation that a war or military strikes right now, not the best option. But there's definitely a risk, a continuing risk of military escalation as the United States and Iran uh, confront each other on a range of issues, from the nuclear issue to Iran's support for uh, regime change and terrorism throughout the region. And what does Kim Jong-un think about all of this that's going on uh, with Iran as he thinks about his next move? So this is the great question. Can you trust the deal that you do with the United States? So if you're a Korean leader and you're looking at how the JCPOA turned out, you see the United States unilaterally walking away from this agreement and Secretary Pompeo have said that you know you should know that when a new president comes in everything is up for grabs mm -hmm. again and then when Muammar Gaddafi did a deal with the United States five years later he was being killed by his own people as part of a US supported regime change effort so this is really the sort of thing where Kim who is a survivor whose family has been a survivor for generations has really got to be thinking what kind of deal what kind of safeguards and how much or how little he's willing to give